Words of life indeed. That comes from um, John 6. And I always thought that John 666 was appropriate place for that part of what the scripture said. John 666 says, From that time many of his disciples uh, went back and walked no more with him. And I'm going, well, that's a fitting verse. And then uh, after that, Jesus looks to his main disciples there. And he says, uh, will, you, will you leave me also? Of course, he knew the answer to that. But it was for as much Peter's confession as it was anything, because Peter's the one that said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And uh, this is what we have here tonight with us. Amen. The words of eternal life. There is no other source. There's no other book. There's no other religious doctrine or dogma that you can read and find the things that you'll find in your Bible tonight. There's no other book that God himself is claimed to have authored. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Some say that the Bible was written by men. Well, I agree with that. It was written down by men, but it was God who gave them the words to write. And that's what we believe. That, and those words, miraculously, you show me another text. Going all the way back, the book of Job being the first book written, um, show me a collection of writings that have been preserved the way the words of the Bible have been preserved now for these thousands of years. Uh, I think you'll be hard pressed to find anything like it. Supposedly there was a, a, a library in Alexandria, Egypt. And... Um, I don't remember the whole story, but it seemed like somebody didn't like what all books they had in there, so they burnt the whole thing down. And there's some talk about how the supposedly underneath the Egyptian pyramids is a great library of secret books that, you know, have been never seen the light of day for thousands of years, and they contain the real truth about where we came from as humans and how we got here put on this planet by the gods and i'm just going no it's right here amen we were put here by god himself made in his image uh take a bible turn to um uh, we'll start in ephesians chapter one and um appreciate you coming out tonight we'll go through our prayer list uh here in a little and um uh, it's good to come out tonight and We've had the heat on all day because we got cold air moving in, but some of some it's all I, I never can figure out who to make happy. Got some of you fanning, some of you shaking. So I tell you what, those of you who are shivering, turn around and see where the people are fanning. Why don't you go see if you can sit in their spot and see if that helps. You come sit in their cold spot, because obviously it's cold here. It's warm back down. I did, just the suggestion. I mean, I'm not trying to cause a church split or nothing over it, but anyway, Ephesians chapter 1, and uh, it's getting it in that time of year. People's going to start catching colds and everything else, and my wife says stay away from her, because she's got a surgery coming up November 19th, and they said if she gets sick, any time between now and then, it's off. So, where's your mask? She's got it in her, yeah. So, if she seems standoffish to you. She is. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And I've got an article here that I'll read to you uh, to sort of illustrate why this is important. When, when do you receive 
the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When does that happen? And because uh, I think it's important. I think if we're wrong on what we believe, uh, some people are in trouble. Um, so we want to know the truth. We want to know it from the Word of God. And I'm not necessarily trying to pick at somebody because I've known some good Bible believers who have been taught a different way. And um, they use some scriptures for their, for their background. And I, I don't mean to, you know, if we, if we want to, we can fight about anything and everything in the Bible. And I don't think we really ought to do that, especially among those who we know believe the Bible. Some just see it a little different. I've learned that over the years. And, uh, but I do think it's, I think it's important to someone who, who, just, who is just led to Jesus Christ they're a babe in Christ, and um, is it not important to them that they have the help and the aid of the Holy Spirit in their life from that moment on? Does not God need to be present with them, especially while they're new Christians? I, I, and I think yes. So Ephesians chapter 1, we'll read these verses that I have up on the screen. I want you to open your Bible up and make some notes tonight. Uh, because, I mean, um, you probably have friends on Facebook that may believe that the Holy Ghost comes at a later time and, and um, they may challenge you on what you believe. And you say, well, I believe this way, but if you don't have Scripture to back it up, they're going to they're gonna run over you. And uh, so the, the Bible tells us to be ready to give an answer. To everyone that asks us of the faith that we believe in. I believe, you ought to, I believe you ought to learn your Bible. So Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. The Bible says, in fact, yeah, I'll, let's read these and I'll probably stop and give the context after we pray. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of the truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. And we'll back up and give the context of that uh, just a minute. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Pray for one another tonight. Pray for those who are sick, those who are in need. We've got several needs. Uh, pray for the people in Kenya. Uh, we're planning on uh, going back there next month and uh, making the devil very angry at us by doing good deeds. And so uh, just pray for our work. Father, we love you and we thank you for uh, the ministry you've given us. We thank you for the faith that you've given us. We pray, God, that you would lead us and guide us with that faith and keep us in that faith. Father, our will and our desire is to serve you. But sometimes how to do that without, uh, without stepping out of line, without sinning. Father, to find out how to do that sometimes, we don't know that. Neither did Paul. And so, Father, we pray, dear God, that you would keep us on days when we don't do so well ourselves. That you do for us, God, what God does, what our Father does for his children. And pray, dear God, that you bless each and every one that's joined with us tonight, whether it's here in the building, there with us online. We appreciate their faithfulness. And Father, we just ask God that uh, your spirit would guide us and lead us into all truth the way Jesus promised that he would. He would show us things to come, things that we need to know. And we pray, dear God, that we would honor and uplift, magnify your word as your word is magnified even above your name. So Father, fill us with light and truth that can only come from your word tonight. Bless us and prepare us for days that lie ahead of us. And give us answers to our questions on days that are behind. And Father, just meet the needs of your people tonight. We love you and we thank you, Lord, for such a sweet salvation as what you've given us. Father, you hear our prayers and you answer them according to your grace and goodness. Just like we sang tonight, it is by your grace that is always sufficient in our lives for every need. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. 
And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, backing up a little bit, um, in verse, oh, let's see here. Uh, the, pick it up in verse 10 of Ephesians 1, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and I preached this a couple Sundays ago, God's answer to our prayers sometimes is about timing. Um, when Elijah prayed for the fire to come down, you know, he didn't really mean, God, you can do it any time between now and the next six years because the prophets of Baal had already been praying all day long and they had not received Baal's answer to their prayer. So that was a case there where the imminent answer to Elijah's prayer was, it just made sense. Uh, but some things God waits on and he waits for a fullness of time to happen. God always knows when that is. God knows it better than we do. So we learn to trust him in that. But he, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And I believe he's talking about the saints, those that have already died and gone on before us. And then those of us who are behind them, he will one day when it's time. He will come and he will gather both of them together. And then he says, um, verse 11, in whom also we have an, obtained an inheritance. You have already been granted the inheritance. It's already written out in your name. A will has been a will and testament called the New Testament has been written out. It's got your name on it. You know that you are the beneficiary of God's great inheritance called heaven. God is the benefactor. You're the beneficiary. He's the one that's going to grant it to you. You're the one granted it to. And you already have it. It's already there. But there must of necessity be the death of the old man. The old man's got to die before you can get the inheritance. So that's what we're waiting on. Well, we've already had it issued to us. Being predestinated. And this is a word that gets, I mean, it gets messed up. In people's theologies, predestination to some people means that God just selects who he selects and they're going to be saved whether they want to be saved or not. And that is not biblical. That's not scriptural. It's not God. God doesn't choose anybody unwilling to be saved. But he does know those who he knows want to be saved, ask to be saved, continue in the faith. God already has the knowledge of that because God sees all of time, past, present, and future. It, none of it is a mystery to him. He's God. Amen? He's God. He knows it all. So that's how he has predestined us because he knows us. He knows the decisions and the outcomes of all those decisions of our life being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Then, he, that's, then we get into verse 13, in whom ye also trusted. You trusted after that you heard the word of truth, which is the Bible. You heard the word of God, you read the word of God, or it was preached to you, or you saw a video online, or someone shared a pace, Facebook post, or you watched a DVD from our church, somebody else's church or whatever, but you heard the word of the gospel. You can't believe without hearing the word of the gospel. What do you believe in? And so it, it is after you've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, when you believed, and God knew that exact moment when you believed it, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You don't seal the envelope until the letter's in it. Or the check that you're mailing to the electric company. Okay? Then you seal the envelope. And that's that same idea here. You are saved after the letter is in. Now it can be sealed. And you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, um, which is the earnest 
This is how we know then that we are going to be the recipients of salvation. God has given us his spirit and his word. And they always, and I'm going to get to that after this teaching, the connection. When I was teaching you about Jesus, I showed you the connection between Jesus and the Bible. Here, I'm going to show you the connection between the spirit and the Bible. If we say that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, that is what we believe. We, we don't believe that the Holy Ghost operates outside of the, what the Bible says. And so he, that's what he says. Um, the earnest of our inheritance un, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So there is... Um, a, a teaching and it tends to go sort of in the d non-denominational churches those who would not identify as baptist or nazarene or let's say church of god or anything like that or there are some in the pentecostal who might be part of a pentecostal denomination that might believe this not all do not all do not all pentecostals believe this to my knowledge uh, but definitely those who would call themselves of a charismatic church, they definitely believe this particular way. This article is from um, CBN.com, which is, um, who is um, Christian Broadcasting? Who is CBN? Pat Robertson. Okay, this is his outfit. Um he says, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Many people have had an experience like uh, that of the little girl who heard the Holy Ghost uh, mentioned in church from time to time, but so vaguely and infrequently that she could only guess what sort of ghost this might be. So one day when she ventured down into the dark furnace room in the church of cellar, she decided with a child's firm logic that this spooky place must be the, where the Holy Ghost lurked. I don't know what this is all about, but anyway... The fact is, adult believers often act as if the Holy Spirit really was hiding in the church cellar. They may know something about the Holy Spirit, but they don't know him personally or realize that he is God in the same way the Son and the Father are God. When they read the Bible, many people are surprised to find that the Holy Spirit was at the very dawn of time, which he quotes Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Many are amazed to find out there are approximately 100 references to the Holy Spirit throughout the Old and New Testaments. I'm not surprised at that. But see, he's setting up this idea. He's saying that you can be a Christian and not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's what he's setting up. So he says, nevertheless, the Spirit's role is fundamental both to creation and the life of the believer. When a person comes to Jesus Christ, he receives Christ into his heart. The Spirit of God comes and joins with the Spirit of the believer. This indwelling Spirit reproduces the life of, of Jesus in the believer's life. So... Um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an empowering for service that takes place in the life of the Christian. In it, we are immersed in the Spirit's life and power. To illustrate, if we drank water from a glass and the water would be inside us, however, if we went to the beach and stepped into the ocean, then we would be in the water. I, some of this stuff I don't understand there. We receive it as it were a drink of the Holy Spirit when we are saved. But when we are baptized in the Spirit, it is as if that initial drink becomes an ocean that completely surrounds us. See, here they're definitely telling you that it's two different things. That you get saved, you're drinking the Holy Spirit, but you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so they would teach you then that it is a separate work that God does Sometime after. In other words, you can survive. Um, why do we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit? We need a power beyond ourselves for service and ministry of Christ's kingdom. Um, the disciples waited in Jerusalem as Jesus had commanded. So he's setting up the idea here that... Um, it often, here's what he says, it often occurs sometime after the salvation experience. No, it doesn't. You are not saved and regenerated, which is what salvation is, 
except you have the Holy Spirit, period. And of course, the, one of the reasons why I think they do this, because, and this may not be their official doctrine, although maybe in some cases it is, it then becomes a ministry that the church gives you. In other words, being saved is God's idea. Being baptized of the Holy Ghost, well, that power belongs to us. We have to impart it to you. And you may not have it imparted to you if you don't come to us and get it. Does that make sense? I think... That's a big part of why that's taught that way. They want you needy of that church's government or that church's power in your life. You got to, if you want it, you can't just get it on your own. You've got to go see Benny Hinn or you've got to go to Kenneth Copeland or you have to go to some big drunken Festival, if you watched Pastor Mike online yesterday, and I showed that video, and it's from, as near as I can tell, it was filmed at Life Christian Church back before Faith Church bought it out. Rick Shelton is in that video. He was the pastor of that church at that time. He had Kenneth Hagin there, up there, at Fenton, acting drunk with people falling men and women laying all over the top of one another in a gang pile in the church service you got to watch pastor mike online yesterday if you want to skip to close to the end that's fine you got to watch this thing this because this stuff's crazy and i'll tell you who else i saw in that video i never i've seen that video dozens of times and i never saw who else was in that video but you remember the church that kurt warner went to St. Louis Family Church. That pastor was in that video, getting drunk in the spirit. I spotted him there. I never saw him in there before, but he's in on it. So that's, that's that same, they're of the same ilk as far as I'm concerned. And they're telling you that the Holy Spirit coming on you makes you drunk. And that, you have to understand... Uh, if you go back and watch that video, you will clearly see the first four or five rows of that church are marked with reserved signs. Reserved for Kenneth Copeland. Reserved for Gloria Copeland. Reserved for um, the lady that plays Ellie Mae Clampett on Beverly Hillbillies. Who is she? Donna Douglas. She's in that video. You see her there. Okay, we, our girls met her. You remember that? Okay, she was there. And that's forbidden in the book of James. You are not supposed to reserve pews in church for special people. Not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to show favoritism to anybody. But see, there's a reason why they did that. Because they know that the people who would play along with the drunk act, and most of it probably was, are the ones that they designated to sit in those front rows to put on that show. Kenneth Copeland is putting on a dog and pony show in there. He's not really under the influence of some spirit. He is playing along with his buddy Hagen. Okay? And so are several others. Because if you look at Kenneth Hagen's videos, you can see those same people in other places doing the same thing. So they reserve the front seats for the people they know are going to play along with this thing. But anyway, the Holy Ghost comes on you, does not make you drunk. Amen. So, if it is a second work of grace, then why does, number one, Ephesians say, after you believed, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're sealed with Him. After you believe, you believe, God seals you then. You are saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3. Turn there. Galatians 3. To me, this makes it very clear. 
Um, I'm teaching Galatians 3.1 on Sunday morning, dealing with witchcraft in the church. And uh, they're in Sunday school. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Then he says that he nails it here in verse two. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So did you have to prime the pump? Did you have to have someone lay hands on you? Did you have to have some sort of church ritual done on you? Did you have to have a special service where the Holy Ghost was going to be outpoured? Did you have to pay money to get in? Did you whatever? Uh, did you did you have to send in X amount of dollars before you could be one of the recipients of the laying on of the hands of whoever these people were, these apostles? Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Hearing is... The word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the, by the word of God. When you believe, here's Brother Sterling in his living room. Glenn Rakup and, and, uh, and Ken Goff is preaching revival. Go to Sterling's house in his living room. He's given the scriptures to him in his living room that night. And he believes it, right? He got saved in his living room that night. And he was sealed. He received the Holy Ghost that night in his house. In fact, the Holy Ghost showed up before the two preachers ever did. The Holy Ghost stayed after the preachers left to continue the work in him that is continuing to this very day. All then, what year was that? 60? 70? 71? Somewhere around in there. And that's been going on. The same spirit has been working on him ever since. Okay. So it happened when he heard the word and believed the word of God. Acts chapter 10. Turn there. Well, in fact, let me keep reading in Galatians 3. Uh, verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So there again, he is attaching the work in the Holy Spirit, whether it's directly in his life or through the ministers who are working in his life. He's still attaching it to the word of God, the Bible, and not some extra event that takes place. Acts chapter 10. And those who believe that baptism of the Holy Spirit is some second work of grace that happens after you are saved. Here is, in Acts 10, we have really the first Gentile believer. The first true, pure Gentile being saved. And it's Cornelius. God set this up. God gave Peter the vision. God gave Cornelius the vision. God's going to bring them two together because he's going to save Cornelius and his house. So look at what happens. In Acts chapter 10, verse... I have verse 44 up on the screen. Um, look at verse 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be judge of quick and dead... To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Verse 44. Here's, P here's Peter preaching the word of God. Verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which did what? Heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. It happened the same night that Cornelius heard the gospel, the preaching of the word of God. He was saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. And some people like 
our friend Pastor Kelly. Uh, Pastor Kelly's testimony was that he grew up in church. Lost. Had 20 years straight Sunday school attendance. Lost. And that God saved him and called him to preach the same night. Filling him with the Holy Spirit the same night. Saved and called to preach. And that's how, that's how it was with Paul. Saved, called to preach the same night. Okay? So in Cornelius, the very first Gentile believer. To me, it sets the standard, I believe. Here's Peter preaching. He's preaching out of the, he's preaching out of the word of God. He's preaching the prophets. He's preaching the gospel. While he's preaching, the Holy Ghost fell on Cornelius and his house. And they're both saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And they give evidence of that while speaking in tongues. And so in Acts chapter 15, uh, turn there. I don't know if I have that in my notes. Yeah, Acts chapter 15. Um, Peter gave testimony of that in verse 7 when there had been, because they were deciding on whether or not the Gentiles had to keep the law and be circumcised. So when there had been much dissension or disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of God hear the word of the gospel and believe and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us and put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. And he said, I was there. I was preaching. They heard the word of God. They got saved. God purified their hearts, filled them with his spirit. They spoke in tongues just like we did, didn't he? And P Peter had probably people with him. Said, yeah, we were there. We saw it. They all knew that story. So back in Acts chapter 11, Peter again, this time, same thing. Acts chapter 11, verse 15. Uh, we can go back to verse 13. He showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's telling this story again. Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. He's talking about on the day of Pentecost. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now here's my point. Who gives this baptism? Is it God or is it the church? The church gives water baptism. But not Holy Ghost baptism. And again, that's my suspicion. Is that they teach that Holy Ghost baptism will come to you later. But it'll probably be done in some special service that we perform over you. And I think it's a power play. To lock people in. You want to get the Holy Ghost? You got to get it from us. Same way the Catholic Church deals out indulgences. So um, back in Acts chapter 11 again. Verse 17. For as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us. And by the way, it's a gift. You don't earn gifts. Ever. Ever. The like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I? That I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. It was done the same night that Peter preached, Cornelius was saved, was filled with the Holy Ghost in so much that they spoke with other languages. So I believe it's given at salvation. Galatians, back to Galatians 4 now. Um, again, you might be, those of you at home, um, take notes. If you're on your computer, your tablet, 
get a note taker like Evernote or there's dozens of them. Or just start keeping a document where you keep all your notes, which is what I did several years ago. I just copy and paste scripture and put it under different headlines. When I wanted to learn about salvation, I just opened me up a Word document and I titled it Notes on Salvation. And every, I looked at every place in the Bible where it said save, saving, saved, savior, saviors, savingly, savingly, ing, saving nests, or what, just whatever. And I started reading every verse, and then you could take verses, then put them in different categories. This is how God saves. This is for how long God saves. This is why God saves. And you just, that's how I learn things. That's how I keep track of them. So Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Holy Ghost is also the spirit of God's son, Jesus Christ. So you can, you can write phrases like Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Spirit of God, Spirit of the Lord, Phrases like that, you can also put down Spirit of God's Son, Spirit of His Son, Spirit of Jesus Christ, Spirit of Christ. Because all of those titles are one and the same person. They, re they tell you that they are, it is a different way of referring to the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits. Doesn't matter what title they are, they're all the same. And because they're the Spirit of God's Son, when you are saved, you are born again, conceived by God the Father. He then, I mean, what did God do with Adam after he fashioned him out of clay? What did he do to him? Immediately. Breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. That's why Luke has Adam listed as the son of God. You cannot be a son of God, a child of God, without the spirit of God's son dwelling in you. And when he's dwelling in you, you know it because then God stops becoming this distant deity that cannot be reached to being as close to you or closer than your own father was. Was you ever afraid to tell your dad that you did stuff wrong? But my heavenly father never been afraid to tell my father what I've done. Because I know him. I know he's my father. And I know that he's probably going to give me a whipping. I know I've got it coming. You know you're saved when you say, God... Uh, I think you ought to beat me for that one. That was bad. I don't think you ought to let me get by with that one. What did I just say, God? But you say things like that to God because he's not some distant God anymore. He's your father. He's your Abba. That's what little Hebrew children, first words they learn how to say. They can't say sesquicentennial and Mississippi and coefficients. But they can say Abba. And they know who it is. And I know who my father is. And I know he loves me the way a father loves his children. And I, when we had Lindsay, 
all my years of Bible college training, all my years of learning in church, all of a sudden became real for the very first time to me because now I'm a father. And I see myself, my relationship with my children, the way God must see him and my relationship with him. That he loves me and there isn't anything he would not do for me. Except leave me. He's not ever going to leave me. Isn't it a shame? We've got children growing up all over this country. Whose daddy's left them. They'll never know what it's like to have a daddy who loved them, except they be introduced to God. Amen? What a shame. You see, that's the spirit that you get. How can you say that you're saved, except you have the spirit of God's Son dwelling in you, crying, Abba, Father? How can you say that? Second Corinthians. Oh, let's deal with this now. So, they say the baptism of the Spirit involves slain in the Spirit. Now, um, I've done things on this in the past. I'm, I'm bringing it back up again this week in the Watchman broadcast. Because I'm showing you, and I'm going to spend some time with it tonight, Slain in the Spirit is not a Bible doctrine. It is not a Bible doctrine. Who first introduced that? I'm not sure. I just know it wasn't the apostles. You don't see anybody on the day of Pentecost falling backward as dead men with people catching them. Women putting blankets over ladies' skirts to cover their modesty. You don't see that on the day of Pentecost anywhere. You don't see it in the days of the early church. You don't see it in any of the letters that Paul wrote. Paul wrote 14 letters to the churches. You would think something that important would get included in there, and it's not in there. They extract it in some bizarre way, but it's not there. And what it literally means is to be murdered. You have your spirit murdered, slain, killed. And they say that then is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When we hit you on the head, you fall backward. They catch you if you're lucky. And then you rise back up again. That sounds like something out of a secret society, but not something out of the Bible. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who hath who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The Holy Ghost, when it comes on you, does not slay you. Does not kill your spirit. I mean, it'd be one thing if it'd be, say, you know, slaying of the flesh, crucifixion of the flesh. That I get. But not my spirit. While my flesh dies, my spirit lives. Okay? My spirit does not need to be reborn it's already alive john 6 63 it is the spirit that quickeneth which means made alive the flesh profiteth nothing the words that i speak unto you they are spirit they are life genesis 2 7 the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man was slain in the spirit no man became a living soul is what it says so again no doctrine no scriptures anywhere indicating to us that to be baptized in the Spirit means... And then they... You know, for years you had preachers going around touching people in the head, laying hands on their head. Then they got really theatrical with it. Then you guys got guys, got guys like Benny Hinn taking his coat off in a big show and whipping it around like that. And people all of a sudden are falling down because Benny Hinn's coat air touched them. Put some deodorant on, you Palestinian guy. That's what, the, and that's what it's turned into. Go back and watch that video I played yesterday during Pastor Mike Online. You're going to see Kenneth Copeland. 
This is what really gets me. While Copeland is down on all fours acting like a drunk, there's another man laying over there. He's already gyrating and laughing. Copeland crawls over there, touches him again, and he, he erupts in a new burst of laughter and convulsions like, I have the power that if I touch you, you're going to get more of that. That's a put on. So, okay, pastor, is, are you saying it's fake? I'm saying even if it is fake, it's still, if it's fake, it's definitely not the Holy Spirit. And if it's real and it's not the Holy Spirit, you've got something far greater to worry about. Because there is an, an Indian Hindu yogic, Technique, and I watched a video today of a guy doing this. He was a Hindu yogi, and all he was doing was sitting in a chair in a state of deep meditation. And this was done outdoors in this nice little serene setting, and there was two pillows placed on the ground in front of him. As people would come and sit down on the pillows in front of the guru, he wouldn't even move. He wouldn't open his eyes. He wouldn't say anything. But the moment they sat down and situated themselves, boom, you could tell they got taken over by a spirit. Convulsing. Gyrating. Their head flailing about falling backwards and then the camera would cut somebody else would walk over they would have a very peaceful serene smile on their face they would sit down and no sooner than they got set down boom that spirit would come on them again they would convulse they would fall backward this guy didn't even have to touch them and that's one of the things about Shakti pot Shakti is the female spirit Pata means to fall, like falling backwards. And they say it can be done by him touching your third eye, or it can be done by him giving a word, or it can be done simply because the powers that he has when you're in his presence just overtakes you. But one after one, these people would come, and no sooner than they would sit down, a spirit would enter them and cause them to go into convulsions and fall backward. That's devils. So if, at, at best, if all they're doing is putting on a show, that's the least of your worries. It's still not the Holy Spirit. If they really can manifest a spirit that way, you're in deep trouble because now you've got a devil beast spirit taking you over. Still not in the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Not a slaying spirit. A spirit that makes people alive, that gives them life. Um, I'm not going to get into all this falling backward stuff. Uh, we may talk about this next Wednesday night, about whether or not it's right to be drunk in the spirit. Is that even... Is that even a thing? And I was with Stan Johnson of the Prophecy Club several years ago. And there in, can't remember where we were, probably Topeka, Kansas. But I was doing a talk on the Da Vinci Code. And I had mentioned, you cannot drink the cup of the devils in the cup of the Lord. And I said, the cup of devils makes you drunk. And when I got done, Stan and his wife, they came to me and they said, we had pretty much decided you've never been drunk in the spirit, have you? And I went, no, sir, I have not. We can give you that impartation if you want. I said, don't you touch me. Absolutely not. Want nothing to do with that. But these people believe that you get drunk by the Holy Spirit of God. That's an abomination, people. That's the replacement for the Holy Spirit. Amen.